Well, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to our Four Seasons Gardening 2017 Winter Webinar Series. And today we're going to cover house plants. Um, my name is Rhonda Furry. I'm the horticulture educator right in the middle of the state. I cover uh, Fulton, Mason, Peoria, and Tazewell counties. Uh, there should be a handout that, or several handouts actually, that were emailed to you. One is uh, how to have healthy house plants is the hand, handout name, of course, and kind of just walks through uh, some of the points that I make. And then on the back has a chart uh, with the various plants that I'm going to be covering. Uh, there also are handouts, of course, with the PowerPoint presentations uh, that you could print out as well. So hopefully today I can uh, make sure my goal, I guess, today is to make sure that we, even those with a brown garden thumb, can have a healthy house plant in, in your home. House plants have been uh, shown to have, make us happier and healthier. Uh, research shows that they fill a psychological need. Uh, they yeah, satisfy our need to care for living things and provide a link to our natural world, even you know when we're indoors. NASA's done a lot of research, as have others, on how houseplants uh, cleanse the indoor air, and that makes them very important. And it also, research has shown that it can increase productivity for employees when plants are around. So the picture you're seeing there is actually my office. I'm sitting at that chair uh, right now, and I have a lot of plants in, in my office, and so hopefully that's helping me to be uh, more productive as well. We also know that house plants can really enhance our environment, whether it's in our home or if it's in more of a commercial setting. Um, obviously, they're aesthetically pleasing, uh, but they also can be very functional. You can use house plants to direct traffic. Uh, this uh, picture here is an Indianapolis hotel, and you can see that these plants are set there partly to draw attention to the, the business sign, but also to direct people so they don't uh, run into those poles that are there. Uh, we also, uh, with proper numbers and placement, the house plants can serve as sun, uh, sound barriers or buffers as well. So what I want to do is we're going to go through uh, some selection criteria for uh, choosing the right house plant uh, for your home. There's lots of different factors to consider. We always, of course, whenever we talk about plants, we often say right plant, right place. And that's true indoors as well. So uh, indoors, of course, uh, we have limited light often. So light is a major factor. And, and many greenhouses and producers will, will tag their plants with the light requirement on them. And you can see here uh, that this tag example I show you, it shows in the bottom right corner of that picture that it's a medium light type of plant. You could also think about when you're selecting a house plant, uh, the ease of care, how hard it is to take care of. I'm going to show you several examples today, and I'm going to talk about some of the easiest uh, to take care of, the easiest to grow indoors first, and then we'll end up with uh, some of the harder ones at the end of the presentation. Uh, maybe you want uh, flowers or, or foliage or certain colors in, you know, just to uh, help with your design style in your home. So there's lots of different uh, selection criteria. I am going to cover two things today. Of course, I mentioned already that house plants can help to cleanse the air. Uh, whenever I mention that a, a plant that I'm covering is an air cleaner, you will see that little cloud. And then I also will mention a little bit about the whether or not the house plants are poisonous because we get lots of questions about that. And we want to choose our plants carefully, obviously, if we have children or pets. So I will use this little mushroom icon uh, throughout the presentation uh, when that plant is considered poisonous in some way. And again, some of them are, are more poisonous than others. It, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't use them. It just you need to be aware of that. So let's look at some of the environmental conditions when our factors to cho when choosing you know the plants that you're going to grow indoors. The most limiting factor when growing plants indoors is light, and the two obvious light sources that you're going to use are is the natural light that's coming through the window or some type of supplemental light um, with some you know light bulbs and such indoors. Uh, the natural light actually can be uh, reduced, uh, even though it's coming through the window. Uh, this is my kitchen window here, and outside of it is actually winter, but outside of it is a pergola. In the summer, there's a tree, and, and so the leaves will block some of the sun. Uh, sometimes on cloud, cloudy days, it's going to have less light coming in. If my windows are dirty, it's going to have less light coming in. 
And also, we just got new windows, and so the more energy-efficient windows, some of those alter the wavelengths that come through that, that glass. So all of those can um, make it even more of a limiting factor indoors uh, for growing plants. So. The other environmental factor to consider is humidity. Um, and we'll look at that here. Humidity and temperature are the, the next two. Uh, as you know, most houses are really dry. Uh, this is a, a little humidity monitor that I have in my house, and I try to keep it within that desired range. But even that is more for humans than for plant growth. Most of our interiors are less than 20% uh, uh, relative humidity. But, of course, most of our plants, like most of them, and obviously there are exceptions, but most of them prefer uh, relative humidity, humidity levels of 35 to 85 percent. Uh, we can actually increase humidity levels in our home, obviously run a humidifier, which I do. If you group plants, they, as they transpire, they're going to give off, and you'll, you'll increase the humidity. And you can also put them on trays of pebbles in water uh, that will you know, help to increase the humidity as well. And then the third environmental factor um, to consider when growing plants indoors is temperature. We usually, of course, maintain our indoor environments for our human comfort, which is 60 to 80 degrees, so depending on, you know, your comfort level. Most plants prefer a similar type of a daytime temperature, but they often will uh, prefer a cooler night. Uh, I've found that temperature is usually not a, a major factor when growing house plants, uh, unless you know I have that plant where it's going to receive a blast from you know the heater or the air conditioner vent, or maybe if I have it too close to a doorway, especially in the winter where it could get a blast of cold air. So those are just some things to think about when you're considering the temperature for that plant. Again, I mentioned uh, poisonous plants. Uh, there are many, many resources available to find, you know, toxicity information about house plants, both for humans and for pets. Uh, I like this one, particularly from University of California. Uh, you can see the web address up there. If you do a, a search for other uh, university and, and educational institutions, you'll find lots of lists out there. Uh, and so. He, more information plant might be poisonous and, and affect your pet or your child. The other factor that I mentioned, of course, is that our, our house plants help to clean the air. Of course, they're also releasing oxygen that I, you know, that we need to breathe air in in the indoors. Uh, the, again, NASA's research shows that plants can purify the air. Uh, this is a Pinterest pin that I really like that shows. I mean, and again, there's lots of those out there as well. Uh, but this one shows uh, 15 house plants that you can use to uh, purify your air. And uh, if you're a Pinterest pinner, <laughs> then you could go out to my, uh, I have a Pinterest site. It's IL River Hort is, our, is my uh, Pinterest site. And uh, I have a board that's uh, indoor plants. And you can see this pin there as well as several others. So let's start with some easy house plants. So I'm going to look at five, just five examples of house plants that are really easy to grow. Um, most of these plants require really low light, again, because light is the most limiting factor indoors. And they also uh, require other, you know, really little care. Uh, and most of them also can withstand irregular watering, which is, is the main way that people kill plants indoors is mainly uh, by improper watering. So let's look at these five examples. The first one that I, I'm going to cover is the mother-in-law's tongue, and or also called the snake plant, and I really do think this is the easiest house plant to grow. Uh, you'll notice each of my uh, slides are going to be set up the same for covering these plants. So it'll have the common name at the top and then the scientific name, a picture, and then a little more information on the right there about that plant. And again, it will have that cloud icon if it's an air cleaner. It's been proven to be an air cleaner. And then I'll have the, uh, the mushroom there if it's a, shown to be a poisonous plant in some way. So this plant actually comes in both solid green and variegated leaves. This one that you're seeing is mine. I've had since I was a little girl, actually. Um, and it's a variegated one that I really like. I take it outside in the summer sometimes, and, and it will bloom, which you're seeing here. Usually, usually doesn't bloom indoors uh, or look. Our light levels are a little too low for that, typically. If someone tells me that they killed a mother-in-law's tongue, they probably overwatered it. 
because uh, this plant really likes dry to moderate watering, as you can see, and warm temperatures, a tropical type of plant. But it will go a long time without water, and it'll go a long time in the dark. So it's just a really durable plant, uh, and one that if, if somebody tells me they have a brown thumb and they really can't grow a house plant, I'll tell them to get a, a mother-in-law's tongue and to not overwater it. The second one then is a really common house plant, of course, is the heartleaf philodendron. Uh, this one is, as you can see mine, I have it in a hanging basket. You can also have it in other types of containers. A really a durable plant, again, uh, can do really well in low light and kind of irregular watering. Uh, uh, medium watering is its preference, which I'll explain what that term really means here in a minute. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, really, if you forget to water it, it's, it's usually going to be okay. If it's grown in higher light levels, it usually requires a bit more water. And by the way, there's uh, several other types of philodendrons available uh, that, uh, in addition to the heartleaf philodendron, but this is the only one that I'm going to cover. You'll see this one does have the little mushroom there, and that's because it has uh, ox, uh, oxalate in it. Those are irritating crystals, um, and they irritate in different ways. And again, there's different levels of those toxicities between the various plants. So again, you can go research and, and find more information about that on those other uh, websites. The third plant then is often confused or, or mixed up with the philodendron or often called a philodendron. Uh, technically, it's not a philodendron. This is a pothos and uh, also called devil's ivy sometimes. It has a variegation. Um, it's a, a, a kind of a, a lighter green and uh, then the philodendron, Hartley philodendron, and uh, then we'll have either a variegation of white or yellow in there. Uh, the variegation is going to be Oh, gosh, it went ahead for some reason. Oh, there we go. Um, the variegation uh, will be, you're not, you're going to lose that variegation, I guess. If you have it in too low of light, um, it likes to have a little bit more light to get that variegation. Um, but uh, generally, it's a very durable plant. Again, medium uh, light, moderate watering, uh, likes warm temperatures, and also has those oxalates in it. Uh, that, that could be a concern for some people. A beautiful, beautiful plant. I think. I, I'm, I, I love house plants, as you can see. Uh, the, then the, this next one is the Chinese evergreen, or aglaonema. This one's mine that I have growing in my living room. It's in a north uh, front window. My front window is a north exposure and very low, low light, uh, and it has done exceptionally well. Um, this house plant has been bred over the years to have, really tolerate very harsh indoor uh, conditions. Particularly, you know, they breed, they've been breeding these so that they can put them in malls and offices and such and, and really last a long time and, and really look good, kind of have that just a maintenance level where they, they just kind of almost look plastic uh, to a degree. A lot, but it still look great. They have a lot of dead leaves and such developing if you have, you know, kind of irregular care. Uh, this one, again, a good, good durable uh, plant, has speckled foliage. All the different cultivars are a little different. And um, again, that same conditions as you saw in those other plants low to medium light, medium watering, warm temperatures, and also can have some oxalates in it. Um, so the aglaonema, one, one, really a great plant to try. And then the fifth one that I think is easy to take care of, is a really easy plant to grow, is the peace lily. Uh, there are uh, the spathophyllum. Uh, the peace lily is often given at funerals, and so it's just a common plant given that way or in kind of dish gardens, for example. And so I actually got this one in, in that way. Uh, this plant's really easy to grow if you give it lots of water. Um, it's actually, as you can see there, it likes heavy water. It will be okay if you forget to water it. And I do forget to water my plants sometimes, or not so much forget, but just don't have the time and, and not, not able to get to it when I need to. Uh, but this one uh, really does, I'm obviously don't drown it, but it does like a, a bit more water. But it also will grow in really low light levels. If it has that white flower, a really spath type of um, white flower, uh, it will need a little bit more light to produce the flower, uh, but otherwise it will really grow pretty well in a low light. 
and something that you to consider with the peace lily, there's a, a few of our plants that have a sensitivity to fluoride. And fluoride, of course, is the substance or the that is added to city water to, to help our teeth. Um, and that fluoride on sensitive plants can cause the leaf tips to brown. Um, but unfortunately, that symptom is really similar to too little water. So uh, it just kind of uh, varies in that way. But uh, fluoride sensitivity uh, might be an issue uh, as well. So those are the five that I think are, are really easy to grow. Uh, so let's think about uh, once you have that right plant uh, in the right place in your home, in the right light levels and such, let's look at some basic care for them. You know, how do you water them? And then I, I think it's important that we also groom and, and clean the plants. Those five plants that I just covered uh, could survive many years with just simply regular watering and even irregular watering and nothing else. But of course, uh, some periodic cleaning and grooming is going to help them uh, to look a lot better. So let's let's look at these factors a little bit more closely. The first is water, of course, and water is the uh, uh, way that most people kill plants indoors or have problems with plants indoors. And again, it, generally it's because they water too much. And um, I, I have been developing some YouTube videos and uh, they're out on my YouTube channel. I'll show you the link to that at the end of the presentation. But I have one on I just pr produced just a month or so ago on watering houseplants. So if you uh, want to actually see a video on that, please go do it. Um, I wanted to show the video here, but uh, Skype for Business is, um, wasn't really being cooperative on that. So that's fine. I'll just maybe if you want to see it, you can go uh, look later. In general, the way uh, we think about watering is, uh, again, typically, not all plants are the same, but typically, um, depending on the plant type and its growing conditions, uh, we want to water thoroughly and less often. Uh, it's typically, we would say to water the entire soil profile and so that the roots are really going to grow in that whole container. Uh, you've probably, um, you know, knocked a plant out of its container, a, plant, a house plant in, that's grown in the house, or even a container outdoors. And if you just water it a little bit on the top inch or so of soil, that's really where the roots will grow. And they don't tend to want to grow in that whole container. So uh, we want to make sure that we uh, water that entire soil profile, unless it's a plant that um, has a different type of watering requirement, of course. These are common terms that you find on plant labels. Uh, it'll say heavy water, medium, moderate, or light. And so you can see the differences here. Heavy is like that spathophyllum that I just showed you, the peace lily, is a heavy water lover. So we want to keep the soil, I would say, kind of consistently moist, but not soggy. You don't want to drown it. You want to make sure those roots still get some oxygen. A medium watering plant would be that we water it thoroughly. And then we're going to just allow the, the surface to dry a bit and, and uh, you know, touch that surface with our fingers and really uh, see if it's drying out. And then we would water again. Moderate would be we water thoroughly, again, through that whole container, and then allow the entire soil area to dry out before we water it again. And then light watering, of course, there are um, some plants that require that. Um, and so you can you see that you would just lightly moisten the soil around roots and, and then allow that soil to completely dry out uh, before you uh, do that again. And so uh, plants like cacti and, and orchids might be ones that uh, you would have light watering uh, recommendations for those. So those are the, the way those terms work when you look on the label. So when should we water? Um, when is that really happening? Uh, we really need to check that soil by using our finger. Our finger, I really think, is our best tool to determine if that plant needs water. I can also tell, you know, sometimes if I get used to the way I have my different plants, uh, by the feel of the container, by the look of the soil. But sometimes it can be a bit deceiving. So again, oftentimes I, I will actually put my finger down in that soil about an inch or so and just see if that soil has dried out enough that I need to water it based on that plant's uh, uh, watering requirements. Uh, the plant, uh, the container that you're seeing here is actually one that has a water indicator. Uh, it has a reservoir in the bottom and uh, I fill it with water and then it has a little gauge that tells me when it needs watered again. And so uh, it keeps the water, the, the soil kind of um, moist actually. And so I would recommend an anthurium like what you're seeing here or a spathophyllum in, in that particular type of a container. 
Typically don't recommend moisture um, meters. They're not real reliable. They're, they're measuring salt levels and other things in the, in the soil, and so it might be other factors that uh, affect it. And we usually would say to avoid calendar watering. So if you just simply water every Sunday, regardless um, and whether it needs it or not, that you know obviously we want to water the plants when they need it. Uh, but but I also tell people that calendar watering is a good reminder that you know you just think Sunday, I, okay, I better go water that plant if if you forget. It's because like uh, sometimes people do, especially if they don't have very many. So let's look at this little chart uh, table, and you can see that some of the injury symptoms on a plant are the same, whether we overwater or we underwater. And so wilting is that first one, for example. Notice that wilting is a symptom of both. So it's not a good indicator that a plant needs water. I, I have people tell me, well, the plant's wilting, so I just give it some more water. And um, maybe uh, they are overwatering it uh, too much, and, and, uh, and that's the problem. You also see that over and underwatering will yellow new leaves. Underwatering actually yellows the old leaves. If, if you have a philodendron or a pothosum, you notice that uh, you know a really long vine on it. Uh, maybe that the um, uh, leaves are you know fall, yellowing and falling off the oldest ones that are closest to the container, and then it's putting on new growth at the end. And so that's sometimes a, a symptom of underwatering. And as is, uh, spider mites are uh, happen typically more in dry environments, and root rots are going to happen more in wet environments. So just for example, just uh, some examples of how you know the plant's going to react to both of those uh, severe type of uh, situations. And then I mentioned that I think it's important that we groom and clean our plants, that we keep them healthy, clean, and, and really looking good. And so I, I really start by, of course, removing any dead leaves and flowers. Uh, cobwebs sometimes <laughs> that will build up in there, and maybe other mat material that might have accumulated uh, with time, you know. And and then I'm going to clean the leaves, and it, again, it's going to depend on on the plant, on on how I'm going to clean the leaves. Uh, most of our smooth uh, leaved types of plants, I I will use a a soft cloth and and water and a little bit of dish soap. Uh, my my uh, preference is either a dove, a type of a soft uh, dish soap, or pine saw, actually, I like to use too. That little bit of pine, I think, um, helps um, as well. Or you can spray leaves with a non-ammonia type of glass cleaner. Uh, I think Sparkle is, for example, one that has a non-ammonia in it, and it kind of wipe them clean. Or or put some, you know, water not uh, in a spray bottle and just uh, wipe them off that way. For plants with hairy leaves, like this one, this African violet, I would rec you don't want to spray them with water or wipe them off with water. Uh, you want to use maybe a feather duster or some type of a soft bristled brush uh, since that moisture uh, can damage the leaves. And we don't want to ever use mayonnaise or furniture polish or some of those other, other uh, things that maybe your grandma had told you years ago <laughs> that you should do. Uh, think If you think about it, it makes sense that so those are, are products will actually clog the pores and, and could ultimately harm that plant. So um, I also have a video available out on my channel that um, shows how I clean and, and groom plants. I do notice a few questions coming in, and I'm going to actually answer all of those at the end. So I'm not going to ignore you, uh, but I will get to those when we're, when we're done at the end. So let's, you know, for a lot of people, that might be all they need to do. They make, make sure they put it in the right place, in the right environment, and then water it right. And maybe, you know, clean it up every now and then. Uh, but if you want to take it to the next level, maybe do some repotting and such, uh, then, you know, you might consider, you know, different containers. Uh, if it's a plant that's growing well in your indoor environment, you might uh, want to consider fertilization. We'll look at that a little bit closer. And then also, uh, I'm not going to really cover pest management because that could be a whole presentation in and of itself, uh, but I will uh, mention that just a little bit as well. So taking it to the next level here. Uh, first, of course, our containers. Uh, containers come in lots and lots of different styles and colors and, and uh, you know, different are decorative, of course, and you want to fit one that will fit your interior design style, maybe your color scheme. Everybody's a little different. Uh, this is several years ago in my house. It, it doesn't look like that at all anymore, but just to show you that there's, you know, some baskets, there's some plastic containers there, there's some clay containers there, so uh, a lot of different types of containers that are available. Of course, the container provides support and 
and drainage. We always want to have a drainage hole in our container. Uh, we water it thoroughly, like I said, so that, you know, that, but have a drainage hole so that that water can drain out of that container and we uh, don't have it sitting and, and drowning the plant. So uh, again, lots of different containers. The potting mix that we use if we're uh, repotting would be, uh, typically we would recommend a soilless mix and that instead of having, you know, soil from the yard, for example, it's going to be composed of peat and, and some kind of other material that's going to create a, a properly porous mix that's going to drain appropriately for, you know, the various types of plants. We also want to make sure it's very sterile. So I like to use, just go per purchase a good general purpose, potting soil, a potting mix. We don't want topsoil. Um, that's not going to have the amendments that it needs to drain properly. We certainly don't want to go out and dig up soil out of the garden and put in a pot indoors. Uh, that often will kind of turn to concrete. And again, it needs some amendments in there to, um, um, to actually um, work properly in a container type of environment. Uh, as you know, if you go to the store, uh, like everything anymore, it seems like there's lots of options. And so uh, lots of types of potting mixes are available as well. Uh, again, you can see here, I think I've got a cacti one on the left, and then uh, African violet one in the middle, and then just the general purpose one on the right. Um, as far as the water absorbing polymers, so usually they come in a blue bag. I often recommend those for outdoor containers, but I don't usually recommend or want to use those indoors. I want to control the watering indoors myself, and, and uh, sometimes those water-absorbing polymers indoors can keep the soil a bit too moist, uh, especially because our plants typically aren't growing as much uh, when we have them in an indoor environment. And I, I usually want to add my own fertilizer or take care of that myself. Uh, sometimes I think that if I use the ones that have added fertilizer, it can uh, just be a bit too much for an indoor plant. But as some of you might have had, you know, success for that. With that, it, it just kind of depends. But that's uh, my preference. And then fertilizer, um, if you have a plant for a really long time, if it's a blooming plant, if it's a plant that um, has been in the same container for maybe, you know, years and years and years, a, a good example would be a 100-year-old heirloom Christmas cactus, for example, that's never been in a different container. Uh, you know, it, it may be uh, that it, it could use some uh, fertilization. Uh, usually for houseplants, we're going to use a very low fertilizer ratio, very, very low. I often will say use half rate even what it says uh, and just be really careful because uh, we don't want to burn it, burn those plants at all. Um, everybody has a different pre you know, preference in the method that they use, lots of different types available. Um, I often will use the liquid kind. It's kind of there's drops that I put into my watering container uh, when I water when I think those plants are needed or they're actively growing or you know they um, I, again an old container type of a, a thing. House plants are, are in maintenance mode and really never change in size and aren't actively growing. Maybe don't need fertilizer. Uh, some people like to use those little sticks as well. Um, there's sticks uh, available uh, in, for lots of different types of plants uh, too. So again, don't overdo it, um, but if you need some fertilizer, make sure you pick one that is labeled and, and developed specifically for house plants. And then pest management, again, I said I'm not going to go into this uh, much um, because it, again, could be a whole other presentation. Um, these are mealybugs that you're seeing here uh, in this picture. Uh, the best way to manage pests on houseplants is not to get any. And so be really careful um, when you get new plants, either from uh, one that you get from somebody else, one you get, um, you know, as a gift, one you go buy in the store. I always try to keep those a bit separate from the others, watch them carefully, and make sure they're not uh, bringing a new infestation into the house, which unfortunately I've had happen. <laughs> Um, there really are no synthetic pesticides labeled for household uh, plant use, uh, but with perseverance, we can often get control of some of these uh, insects in particular uh, with an insecticidal soap that's been labeled for indoor use. Uh, that grooming and cleaning that I mentioned will also help sometimes with that. Um, if you do use a, a insecticidal soap, make sure you follow the labels really carefully. Uh, the worst infestations I've had on my house plants over the many years that I've had house plants was mealybug on African violet, and uh, that one was I, I really had such a hard time with that. It was when I was much younger, before I went to college actually, 
I ended up throwing some of those away. I uh, had mildew on a cactus that was my son's. Uh, he must have picked up in an apartment he was in. Uh, ended up throwing that one away. Uh, fungus gnats I can usually get control of. Uh, aphids, white fly, and uh, are, I can usually get control of. Uh, and spider mites. Spider mites are more of a problem, you know, kind of a dry environment. Uh, but scale can be a difficult thing to control as well. So uh, again, uh, sometimes I've just started over. Sometimes I've tried to get control of those. Uh, but again, I think the best thing is to really keep those plants healthy so they can fight off pest problems, keep them in the right environment uh, so that uh, they will be nice and strong and can fight that off. Uh, and then again, uh, when you bring new plants in, uh, be careful with that. Okay, I'm going to go through several different diff examples of plants again that we might consider in a house um, for house plants, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll look at these. So these are, I'm going to call them medium difficulty types of house plants. Uh, the first one, uh, mo well, usually when I think of palm, I think that palms are very, very high light, and uh, most palms do require extremely high light levels and uh, are hard to grow indoors. Um, often I'll, I, I will grow some of those big, large palms, but, um, but they're kind of a temporary plant. They don't last more than, for me anyway, a couple of years. But the parlor palm is one that can grow in low to medium light, as you can see here. It's often, you'll find it in dish gardens uh, when you get those, um, you know, somebody gives you a, a gift for Valentine's Day, maybe, which is today, of course, um, or you may, you know, at other uh, um, types of things where you would get a dish garden. Um, it likes it kind of moist to partly dry. I have one actually in my office here. Uh, it's in the window. It gets, I, uh, it dries out really quickly, which part of that for me is the container I have it in. It needs a, a little bit bigger soil uh, um, container. Uh, the parlor palm does like warm temperatures, and you can see that it also is an air cleaning uh, type of plant. The Boston fern is one that I, I really like. I often grow it outdoors, uh, but the Boston fern, and there are some uh, several different types of the Boston fern. This is the, the basic uh, uh, Boston fern that you can see here. Uh, I would say fair durability because if you have irregular watering, you're going to have some leaves drop uh, brown and, and dry and, and drop off. If you bring the Boston fern in from outdoors in a nice outdoor growing environment and then bring it indoors, it is one of those plants that will need to acclimate to that new light level and maybe watering and uh, will drop a lot of leaves. And so uh, that can be a problem or it can be frustrating for you know some people. Often I just start over on my outdoor um, uh, Boston ferns. Indoor uh, our Boston ferns um, really try to keep them in that same uh, lighting condition if I can. Uh, so they can handle pretty low light as long as those leaves have developed in that low light. Um, again, it, it can, depending on the light levels, they could be kind of a heavy watering plant um, and uh, do like a somewhat warm temperature. An air cleaning plant as well, the Boston fern. Probably my favorite house plant, and I must have uh, you know, 20, 25 <laughs> African violets, all different kinds. Um, and uh, I, I love them. I've had them for many, many years. Of course, lots of different colors of flowers and, and you know, doubles that are available. Um, they, I have the best success with my African violets when they're in a north window or maybe an east window. So kind of that medium, definitely, whoops, sorry, I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, definitely an um, indirect type of light, not, not a full sun. This is an understory type of plant in its native environment. So it's going to be growing more of in a shady type of environment. But they do like to be kept really evenly moist. And so the best way to grow African violets is to water them from the bottom, uh, from a saucer or a special African violet pot, and let that plant take up the moisture that it needs. Uh, the other reason why I like to do that is because we want to avoid getting water on the foliage, because uh, if you get even a little drop on those uh, little hairy leaves, uh, it will cause a spot on the leaves. And so you don't want that. You want to have enough uh, leaves all the way through. The anthurium uh, has a spathe spath type of flower, like the uh, spathophyllum. Uh, this is one that's actually in the conservatory at the University of Illinois a Greenhouse in Champaign-Urbana. Um, it's a really nice one. I also have one growing in my office that's in bloom right now. It will bloom in, in really pretty um, low light levels. I have medium light here, um, and but it will the plant will grow in lower light. Um, 
And so, the, again, the, the medium um, light will give you a little bit more flowering. Uh, it does like um, a, a, quite a, a fair amount of water, uh, warm temperatures, and uh, does have some oxalates in there as far as the poisonous plant uh, factor. Spider plants, I have lots of spider plants. You know, you get those little um, spider babies that come off, and uh, and then I, I I just can't throw them away, so I, I keep making more. <laughs> so uh, a nice hanging basket when those uh, droop down. Uh, this plant, in order to produce those offsets and to bloom, it will bloom from time to time, it needs uh, more than 12 hours of light and then total darkness, uh, night darkness for a bit. Boy, I don't know why this is on auto forward. Um, anyways, to produce kind of offsets and blooms, a uh, good durable plant, uh, medium light, medium water, um, medium to all mediums, and, but it is one that does have uh, quite a bit of sensitivity to fluoride. So you might see the tips turning brown from irregular or, or improper, usually low water, or uh, from the um, uh, fluoride sensitivity. The Thai plant is one that I remember from my grandma's house when I was little, and she had it in an urn type of pot and. It was always growing in a really dark place, um, and so I, I just remember that for some reason. But it, it likes kind of low to moderate light. It um, will get if it's a, a cultivar that has this uh, variegation or different colors of leaves. You typically will get those better or more if it's uh, in a moderate or a higher light level. Um, it does like it part dry soil. Uh, kind of cool to warm temperatures, really can handle the neglect. I almost could have put this in the in the easiest plants to grow, uh, but a, a kind of slow growing plant. So the Aspidistra, um, the Thai plant. Lots of different Dracaenas available. I'm just showing you one here, the Warneckii. Uh, this one has a green leaf with a, a variegated leaf margin. The outer edge has a, a kind of a creamy color on it. A good durability, again, um, kind of medium light and watering and, and temperatures. But again, lots of different Dracaenas available. Again, many of those have been developed. The specific cultivars to grow in our extreme uh, kind of situations that we have in an indoor environment. The rubber plant then is the next one. And I have a, this is my rubber plant. It has um, the green leaves on it. Um, and you can see that it is a, a, a I, I find that it's an easy plant for me to grow. I have it in, in medium, maybe to high light is where mine are. It's an eastern window. It gets some morning sun, actually, which it wouldn't have to have. Um, I try to keep it uh, watered, uh, again, the, the soil watered well, and then let it dry out in between waterings. Um, and uh, uh, again, the best way to know that is to use your finger and stick down in the soil and see if uh, that uh, soil is drying out or not. Um, uh, warm temperatures, and then the, the poisonous factor on this one is it has a latex sap, a kind of a milky sap, and so some people are sensitive to that as far as a, a dermal sensitivity. They might uh, get a rash uh, if they have a sensitivity to latex. So that's the reason why that mushroom is on this particular plant. The prayer plant uh, is one that's going to need a little bit more light, um, although, uh, again, often to get those distinctive veins on the on those leaves, there are different cultivars, different types, different species available uh, that have different types of uh, variegation um, and uh, likes a, a warm environment. Is an air cleaner as well. Uh, it's called the prayer plant, of course, because at night it will fold its leaves up uh, like it's praying. The peperomia. Peperomia is one that has really thick leaves. Again, there are different ones available. I'm just showing you this uh, obtusifolia one. Uh, thick leaves, and this one, of course, is a variegated with a creamy on the outer uh, edge. Um, like the same conditions you've seen on all these other plants that I've shown you. Um, this one, I find, uh, does really well uh, for me in kind of a, a, that medium light environment. The umbrella palm is a... Uh, uh, umbrella plant, sorry, umbrella plant. There's a couple of different types of chaflaras. Uh, so I'm just showing you one here. Uh, and uh, again, that one's one that sometimes will be given at the funerals or, you know, in, uh, from a, a florist. Um, and you often will see really huge ones of these growing in malls um, as well. So the um, umbrella plant. Um, 
And the, the poisonous factor on it is the sap can have, be an irritant, a dermal irritant, again, for some people. Diefenbachia, we just have about four more of the, I think, are really common, easy to grow house plants. So Diefenbachia is one that has these the speckled uh, full variegation on its leaves. It's a green leaf with a white um, speckling on it. Uh, excellent uh, durability. Again, one that's often given in dish gardens. It'll come in a very small plant, a dish garden, and then we all need to, you know, repot it and separate all those plants in the dish garden and uh, and put it in another pot. And and you'll find uh, people will find that it gets quite large for them if they have it in the right, you know, medium light, medium watering, medium temperature. Uh, this one is definitely considered a poisonous plant. The level of oxalates in this this plant's leaves can have been shown to be a factor for some, um, you know, small children if they were to eat it, um, or for you know small pets. So um, that one's the one that to, uh, to use caution uh, with that particular plant. By the way, I've mentioned di dish gardens several times, and when you get one of those old dish gardens that has an assortment of several different types of house plants in it. Um, often those houseplants are not all the same right plant, right place. <laughs> so some of they'll put different lighting environment, you know, recommendation uh, types of plants in there, different watering requirement types of plants in there. Uh, so often, you know, they'll grow for a while in that little dish, but uh, it really probably will need to be separated and, uh, at some point. The Norfolk Island pine, this is my Norfolk Island pine. I have had it. Uh, since 1985. <laughs> uh, I bought this particular plant. It was obviously much smaller then. Uh, I bought it at the University of Illinois uh, Horticulture Club Flower Show my senior year in 1985. I uh, got my bachelor's and master's degree at University of Illinois in horticulture. Uh, uh, just an elegant evergreen, sometimes sold at Christmas, but it, this is a tropical plant, so it's not a Christmas tree that we can put outside. Uh, but it really um, has... I have had it in many different homes, many different environments. I've taken it outside. I've left it inside. Right now, it's in a northeast window. Um, and uh, it, again, it's it just one of my favorite plants. It just uh, has done well for me over the years. Uh, it is also a, a air cleaner as well, as you can see. Ponytail palm is an interesting plant. This picture I actually took, obviously, outside is it had that nice swollen base on it, which is a reservoir for water in its natural environment. This was taken in Monterey, California, so it's a you know a warm, a warmer environment. But it is an easy to grow house plant, and if anything, I find that people um, it will grow too large for them if they give it the right environment. And uh, and they it gets too big for their house and, and you know they'll call it, uh, and say hey can you can you take this or do you have the home for this that's bigger than mine uh, so um, again it kind of likes the high light but it likes a dry environment so the ponytail palm can again will res reserve that water in that swollen base so it can handle dry soils this is a very sandy soil you can see it with some cactus and other succulents uh, in this uh, environment. Jade plant. Uh, this is my jade plant. It's uh, really a, a one that I think sometimes can be considered an heirloom plant as well. This, I, my grandma used to grow it a lot. Very slow growing, um, and um, again, very durable. Can handle uh, various lighting and watering and, and temperature, but it likes to do those gradually. So if you do it too much uh, right away, take it from you know really high light to low light or, or whatever, um, then it, it may drop leaves and, and you'll have trouble. But overall, it uh, is uh, just a very dependable plant. Again, it, this is one that has some of those oxalates in it. Not a high level, but uh, it, they are present. And then the last plant that I'm covering in this section is the weeping fig, uh, the ficus benjamina. And there are other figs that are available, um, a fiddle fig, for example. These are the big trees, or they can be a big tree, uh, 6 to 18 feet tall in the right environment. You can see this one's actually the one that has a braided, um, and several trees together with a braided um, trunk. Um, again, all those same conditions we've just talked about. This is one that definitely will drop leaves and acclimate to its new environment. 
And actually what it does is it, it has sun leaves and it has shade leaves. This plant actually creates the type of leaf that it needs for the environment it's growing in. So when you move it from outdoors, for example, indoors, it needs to change its leaves to that uh, lower light level. And so you will often see it maybe completely defoliate and then uh, put out all new leaves. And so uh, uh, again, you'll, you'll have experience of that and we get questions, of course, about that because uh, it's a concern uh, if you don't know what's going to happen. Happen. but it will usually come back so then uh, just finishing up here at the end with some challenging house plants and those would be uh, more you know ones that are uh, maybe a, a flowering plant an edible plant or maybe a very very large plant if you have space for that so flowering plants I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these but the holiday cactus lots of different types of holiday cactus are available the most common one sold in the store is the Thanksgiving cactus it's on the left there it has kind of points on the on the leaves um, but uh, it's often sold as Christmas cactus but it, that's not right if it has the um, uh, the points on the leaves and it's the, really a Thanksgiving cactus and it blooms more around Thanksgiving time the one on the right is a Christmas or an Easter cactus like I have two and I can't remember which one I have in here um, but they're a little bit more difficult to uh, force into bloom uh, the holiday cactus need a, a long night but the real important factor is it needs a cool night so less than 60 degrees consistently for several days or maybe a couple weeks for it to develop its buds and then you move it more into the light and let those buds develop and uh, uh, sometimes if you get it then too warm it'll drop those buds so it can be a, a little bit finicky orchids are the other flowering one that I um, will mention and and really um, I guess I'll do a little advertisement for our next Four Seasons program uh, Sandy Mason will be talking about orchids on March 7th and 9th so if you haven't signed up for that and you're interested in learning more about orchids uh, sign up for our next Four Seasons uh, program and then we do have some edibles I'm, I'm just kind of glancing over at these chats that keep going and questions that are going on in the chat window and one is about herbs and yeah definitely I grow lots of herbs indoors I've been the ones on the right here I've been growing all winter uh, I, I use them almost you know every other day or so I have basil and dill and cilantro and parsley and mint growing in that particular this is an arrow garden that I have that has a self-contained hydro, hyd, hydroponic system that has lights in it uh, the one on the uh, left is a dwarf orange that was actually in an office building that I was in and I oh wow that look at that plant it's it's uh, uh, doing really well it needs really ample light um, and some of these types of edible plants need to be hand pollinated <laughs> Uh, so last year I actually grew uh, salad tomatoes indoors all winter in this uh, system that you're seeing where the herbs are and I had to pretend I was a bee which was kind of fun you know, go uh, when it was blooming go and, and kind of tap the flowers and pollinate them so that it would develop uh, tomatoes so yeah uh, that I've done a whole other program on growing edibles indoors it's up there on the Four Seasons uh, uh, webinar series YouTube channel and you can go back and watch that if you're interested just ending up here with a few other things to think about when growing houseplants one would be vacation care you know we have this beautiful plant and then we go on vacation and it just uh, you know <laughs> doesn't do well when we get back so just like you find care for your dog or your cat when you're away if you're not taking it with you then you need to find uh, figure out a way to for your house plant to be cared for while you're on vacation for short trips you could use a cover uh, cover it with a clear plastic bag to create kind of a closed terrarium environment that's going to remain humid uh, obviously assuming it, it will fit in uh, it's a plant that will fit in that environment uh, we can group them as I mentioned with humidity earlier set on trays of, of water with pebbles now the pebbles are going to keep it from being sit you know that soil being right down in the water it's going to set it up a bit uh, but then as that water evaporates the, the plant uh, will get that humidity grouping the plants together will help or of course the best solution is to find someone to plant sit for you and then the last one of just kind of um, other consideration here would be um, you know we often take our plants outdoors in the uh, summer and then bring them back in in, in the fall sometimes so I uh, if you're interested in in um, or you like to watch the videos I did create a video on this you can see it's at go.illinois.edu backslash furry videos and so I talk a little bit about how to acclimate a plant 
Um, uh, and in general, you know, I would do a cleaning and grooming and then kind of keep it isolated um, and then make sure it adjusts to that indoor environment, uh, not put it in direct sun, check for, again, those insect and diseases, you know, just uh, um, that are going to try to come in and then repot it if you need to, if it's been really growing outside. We do have a houseplant website that's available uh, that has a lot of different, all these, many of these plants that I've covered are there as well as the uh, basic needs. You can see selecting houseplants and uh, much of what I've talked about uh, is found on this website. So illinois.extension.edu, or extension.illinois.edu backslash houseplants is uh, where this particular site is. Here's my contact information, which is uh, also, um, I believe, on your handout. I'm just looking. Yeah, it's on your handout as well. You also see on the handout that I have uh, my um, social media sites, my IL River Hort. Uh, so Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram are all um, at IL River Hort is the address. Um, and then again, I'm in Fulton, Mason, Peoria, and, and Tazewell County. So if you need more information. Uh, if you want to watch this again, or certainly if you want to watch any of our Four Seasons Gardening series for the last uh, few years, and then our future ones, if you're not able to do the live session uh, or you want to share it with somebody else, you can go get these on YouTube at go.illinois.edu backslash Four Seasons Recordings. And they will be up after our Thursday evening uh, session is done. So give us about a week or so to get those up there. Okay, any questions? We're going to uh, go to the questions then in the uh, chat window. So I'll try to go back and, and catch up, and I don't know, uh, Kari and Candace and Martha, if they might help me with some of these. I'm going to back up here. Uh, question, uh, the first one was on Sequoia, and I, I, I really don't have any uh, information on Sequoia. That's a plant I'm not familiar with at all. So I, I, I don't know. You might want to look at California Extension uh, in that particular county where the giant sequoias grow. Uh, do we ever need to repot or stray with uh, nutrient mixes? Um, not sure exactly what you mean there. Um, it may, oh, do we ever need to repot or stray with nutrient mixes? I'm, I'm assuming you were asking about um, a potting mix that have fertilizer in it already. Um, and again, um, that's not usually, I don't usually recommend that, but uh, um, you know, you can start to see if, if the, especially if a plants, if you're watering it right, it's in the right light, and it seems like the older leaves are really uh, starting to yellow, um, that might be a sign that it's root bound and, and needs repotted. Um, it might be that it dries out more often uh, is, than it should. That might be a factor that it needs repotted. So those are all uh, might be reasons. Um, a comment here, I think, I've uh, been treating mealy bugs with insecticidal soap that I bought for $8 a bottle. Do you have a recipe for making your own? I, I don't have a, a recipe per se, but that method that I mentioned of, of cleaning where I use water, um, you know, maybe a, uh, I'm trying to think here, maybe a, a quart or so of water and a um, half a teaspoon or so of, of ivory soap or um, pine saw. The pine, the pine in the pine saw, I also think, has a little bit of insecticidal action. And so um, I will use that. And uh, um, again, I can, uh, as a, a cleaning, but it might also help uh, with getting off some of those insects. But again, it depends on the insect and the life cycle and when it's, you know, if there's eggs there and there's just a lot of factors. So it, as you know, it can be quite uh, frustrating and challenging. How do we discover if the roots are moist? And I, I did notice, Steve, that you, you put that up when I was on African violets, I think. And so um, if that's the case, uh, the African violet really, the roots can stay moist. And so uh, mine actually stay pretty moist all, all the time. It's that heavy uh, watering type of plant. Otherwise, uh, for other plants, again, I, I stick my finger in the soil and, and see if it is uh, dry down, you know, to an inch or so. And and uh, and then, uh, I, and again, I, sometimes I can pick up the container and, and tell from the weight of it as well. 
Uh, let's see, I think the insecticidal soap one I already did. A good place to buy indoor plants. Uh, lots of places to buy indoor plants. Of course, at the discount stores, at the box stores, they can get them a nice variety of plants. A grocery store, you can get plants. Again, any place, I don't care where it's at. If you buy a plant any place, you're going to need to watch it and make sure that it, it's not going to um, get any hitchhikers coming <laughs> into your house, uh, insects or, or diseases. Uh, but there are just lots of, of good place. You know, florists, of course, have indoor plants, uh, house plants available. Uh, some of our farmers markets sometimes have house plants available. Or maybe you could do um, a house plant propagation party with your friends and family and share house plants between each other. Uh, that might be a fun event as well. Uh, growing herbs indoor, definitely, uh, definitely. I, I would, I always have herbs growing indoors, um, especially cilantro. I use a lot of cilantro and a lot of basil. Um, I have hot tea um, every day, several times a day, and I will, you know, throw basil leaves in there, um, cilantro, and you know, lots of things. So yeah, definitely, the herbs will grow pretty easily on a windowsill if you have a bright windowsill, um, or it, um, if you have some supplemental light, uh, that might help as well. Let's see, good place to buy. Does an aloe plant in the bedroom help a person sleep? I never heard that, Deborah. Um, so I have, I don't know, I, I couldn't answer that. I didn't cover aloe. I have a couple. Um, and of course they, um, you know, do have that sap that has some other um, um, purposes, um, but I've not heard that. So I'll have to research that a little bit. Uh, best for sound buffering, and I don't know that it's a particular type of plant more than the way that they're arranged and the size of them. And so you can kind of think even like a windbreak outside. Now, obviously, we don't need one that big, um, but uh, you would need a, a fair amount of cover uh, between the sound and you uh, to create that sound barrier. So I uh, could probably do a little more research on that to uh, find out, but uh, um, that, that's what I would think. Dealing with the fluoride, yeah, the fluoride issue, um, one would be to not use the city water that's fluorinated, to uh, use water out of your dehumidifier, uh, which is uh, kind of distilled almost. Uh, use distilled water. Uh, use water from, you know, uh, somebody who doesn't have city water, like, like me. I have well water, um, really good well water, actually. Um, and so that would be one option. Um, just letting it sit will not let make it go away. Uh, obviously, you're, you're, you're st it's still going to be there. Um, you can sometimes, if the fluorides are, are building up, uh, you can um, kind of leach them out of the soil uh, for some substances. But in general, I would say uh, to use a different water source. Uh, bird of paradise. I have a beautiful bird of paradise in my house. I was looking at it at lunch. and. Uh, um, the bird of paradise is quite easy to grow. I, I take it outside in the summer. That's where it started, was outside in the summer in the absolute full sun. You give it lots of water. Uh, mine's never bloomed, but I'm still I'm hopeful. Um, but it is uh, seven foot tall, and it's a very large plant. I bring it in in the winter, and it's in a southeast window. Um, it does get a good amount of morning sun. Um, and it will stay pretty much, it's got new leaves on it right now. I, t I cut a brown leaf off on Sunday, um, but overall it doesn't change a lot when I move it indoors. So it really has done well for me. So yeah, Bird of, bird of Paradise would uh, be a good plant. A couple more questions here to uh, end up here today. I have had two different types of weeping fig develop ants, uh, never having been outside, any ideas? Uh, I guess it would depend on the type of ant it is. Uh, actually, I had the little uh, little bitty uh, sweet ants in my house just last week. Wow, that they were really. <laughs> and I used the um, oh now I'm gonna go blank. Um, it's uh, like a boric acid type of uh, product. Um, there are some commercial uh, ones available that come in traps or in um, like a little liquid that you put on a piece of, of, of paper or something, and they go to that and then take the uh, boric acid back to the uh, nest and kill all the other ants. And it, actually, it worked really well for me. But if they're the bigger ants, um, that's a whole different uh, story. Um, you might need to use some other types of insect, uh, you know, insect uh, management. And and if we look in our um, insect home. Uh, owner insect manager pest management manual that's in every extension office 
um, we can see what our entomologist would recommend for your specific situation. Uh, so the last one here is, do mealybugs on pothos present like white dust clumps? If not, what is this? Can they live and spread on non-living areas around the plant, pot and pot, stone around the pot, et cetera? Um, mealybugs would need to be on the live plant material. Uh, they, they may present as, um, like you say, that white dusty clump um, that will spread as well. Um, typically, they're not going to, like you say, be on uh, uh, your pot or something like that. So it, you could be having some lichen or, or fungus or, or something else. I'm just, I'm totally guessing here because I haven't seen your situation, uh, but probably something else going on on the non-living surfaces. So um, not sure um, what's happening there. Uh, address for the YouTube channel. Yeah, I'll, I'll type that in, go.illinois.edu backslash. And um, I have two different ones. I'm going to give you the one that I think is easiest is IL River Hort video videos. And uh, that way you can see, oh, I spelled it wrong. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> okay, ignore that one. <laughs> Edu backslash IL River Hort videos. So again, IL River Hort is, um, um, if you want to see my Facebook page, it's Facebook.com slash IL River Horror, and the and same for the others. Um, yeah, and then the other um, recordings, of course, are available for Four Seasons as well. Uh, Pinterest would be the same. Uh, for mine, would be go.illinois.edu backslash IL, I'm sorry. For Pinterest, it would be www.pinterest.com backslash IL River Hort. So again, that a name that I use, I.L. River Hort, which signifies that I do horticulture education along the Illinois River. Any other questions as we're finishing up here today? If not, I will stick around for a few minutes here, and if you think of one as you're um, preparing to exit our program, uh, remember to look for our future programs and to share our YouTube uh, channel with your friends and family to watch so they can watch it as well. Thank you so much.